Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we're continuing our Women in Engineering series, and we're very excited to have with us Amanda Elliott, who is an ENI Reliability Engineer for International Paper. So welcome, Amanda. Hey, Chris. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm excited to talk to you. You've had a, I am too. Sounds like you had an exciting day for our listeners. Amanda was just on a crane. How far up in the air were you? <laughs> Probably 10 to 12 stories. I don't know the exact height, but it was it's pretty unnerving when you get up there. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just going to tell you that's too high for me, Amanda. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not going up there with you. Um, maybe you can take, send me some pictures, you know. Yeah, I, I sure can. <laughs> <laughs> so that's At least all. the weather was good today. So, if, you know, if, if you're up there when you have a really bad storm, that's when it gets a little bit scary, extra scary, I should say. <laughs> I bet, <laughs> but, I bet. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it you know, safely through that. We're excited to have you on here. You know, you're, you're in the plant. Uh, you're, you're definitely, you know, an inspiration to others and excited to walk through this story for our listeners. And we love to start these, Amanda, just by talking and sharing your story with our listeners. So can you kind of walk through your journey for us? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and I guess I just want to start off by saying thank you, you know, for asking me to be a part of this. I'm I'm really passionate about what I do, honestly, and, and women doing engineering and working in manufacturing facilities and working in maintenance groups. I mean, I think this is a really admirable thing that you guys are doing here. So I'm really happy y'all are getting these women's stories out. And um, I, I just want to commend you guys for for taking the time to sit down and talk to these, obviously not just to hear myself talk, but to hear all these other amazing women and, and some of their words of wisdom that I think could help me in my career. So with that, you know, I'll, I'll answer your actual question, but definitely have a, a interesting story, I guess, on, on how I got to where I'm at now. Grew up, up in Smithfield, Virginia. So I don't, you may or may not know, but Smithfield is, used to be the ham capital of the world. That's where Smithfield ham and bacon come from. So that's kind of our, our little claim to fame for my small town. Yeah, very um, familiar with Smithfield, Virginia. So yeah, yeah. I used to go through there but, and, and like uh, I used to call on Smithfield and with some of our sales team. So, yeah, I, I'm with you there. OK, well, most people don't know what Smithfield is, but they know what Smithfield bacon is. So that's kind of my my frame of reference for where I grew up. You know, we had a paper mill pretty close by on a good day. You know, you could smell the the. Uh, packing plant you can smell the bacon on a bad day you can smell the paper mill on a really really bad day you get a combination of both of them so Ooh. it was kind of a, an interesting little area of the world to grow up in but um I, you know in school I was always that kid I had an interest in, in working with my hands I love being outside I love getting dirty um you know taking things apart learning how they work that was kind of my go-to um in high school, I was sort of your typical overachiever, I should say. I was in all the clubs, you know, key club, beta club, all those um, all those after school activities. I was class president, junior and senior year. So I was just always really involved. I, I really I was one of those few kids that just loved high school. I loved to learn. Um, I loved all my classes. I was not really huge into uh, this all the sciences I liked physics but you know I loved English I loved math so so school was just really a good I mean a good experience for me I look back on all my high school years with a lot of fond memories anyways um, later on you know going into my college years I started out actually with a computer engineering major I was looking at schools and, and University of South Carolina was up there on my list because I wanted a big SEC school experience it's not a traditional engineering school, but I visited and I thought, man, this is kind of a unique little department because it's actually the small size is kind of a good thing because you get sort of one on one attention from your from your teachers and you get to know your classmates really well. But I went to one of those welcome to the department meetings for the computer engineering program and I decided, yeah, that that's probably not for me. So ended up switching my major to electrical engineering. I just am more of a team player. I, I love computer engineers. I have a lot of friends that are computer engineers, but 
it's just more of a behind the desk type of job, you know, individual type contributor. And I'm just a, I'm just a people person. I can't help myself. Really enjoyed my college experience. I got involved in a lot of on-campus clubs and activities, just like I was involved in high school. And I worked several jobs during the school year. I did a undergrad research in a, in the mechanical engineering lab, actually, which is kind of interesting because, you know, mechanical, electrical, that's always a fun little rivalry there. But I helped build circuits for them in the mechanical engineering lab. And I did a little bit of work study. And something I was really passionate about at the time was peer tutoring because um, I was one of the few engineering students who was actually a peer tutor. So I was tutoring all a lot of undergrad electrical engineering students and, and mechanical students who had to take electrical classes. And that kind of it, it just helps give you a sense of community in a way, because a lot of these younger kids kind of I say kids, younger students looked up to me. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed doing that and helping them with their with their classes and they would just come sit and do their homework with me and just you know have me check it over to make sure it was right and I really I really like working with a lot of these these students I mean I made a lot of good friends through that program so that was something I enjoyed a lot okay so from the college piece you know go game cops I'll I'll get that in for you so you know you're you have a lot a lot of South Carolina (laughs) listeners out there so uh you made that shift to electrical engineering definitely can appreciate the, uh, the the support and being a peer to others because that's such a big piece that is often overlooked. So where did you shift into, into manufacturing and into the industry rather? So was that right out of college? Yeah. So I, I guess my senior year, I had a concentration. I, I, you sort of take your concentration within your major. And, and I chose power systems because I had spent a little bit of time in the summer working at a utility. So I was interested in high voltage systems. I spent a lot of time learning about three phase transition, uh, I mean, transmission and distribution and and motors. Um, So what utility did you work at? I worked for Dominion. I interned there. Which one? I I used to go to a lot of Dominion places. I worked for Surrey Nuclear. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, they call it Hog Island, which yep. is you know fitting being so close to Smithfield. That's right. That's right. Okay, sorry to sorry to interrupt you. So from there no, you went a, to uh, well, international paper. Yeah. So my senior year, I went to the career fair um, that was USC sponsored. They have a, a science and engineering technology career fair, and I met some folks from international paper. And I had met them at previous career fairs, and they were always trying to get me to intern there, but I was I had always taken the position of Dominion. So I met with some of the folks at IP, and they, they kind of describe how a paper mill works, how most mills are actually mini utilities, but also water treatment plants, chemical plants, and a manufacturing facility kind of rolled into one. So you're talking, you know, five or six different disciplines rolled into one facility. And that's what really drew me into a paper mill and and kind of opened my eyes a little bit to the manufacturing world. I knew I could start to learn a little bit more outside of just transmission and distribution and and just a high voltage switch gear. I mean, I, I enjoyed that stuff, but I also, you know, wanted to have the opportunity to learn a little bit something different, you know, even a chemical side, which I'm terrible at chemistry, but I found that there's a lot of interesting chemical processes here at a paper mill that I would never have gotten to learn if I had stayed utility. And there's nothing wrong with utility. I'm definitely not saying that, right, but right. Um, this kind of gives me a more well-rounded experience in a way. Oh yeah. It gives you just exposure to so many different areas in a paper mill that it has. That's so right. you're, you're all over it. That's great. I mean, and you've been in a paper mill here for a few years what, are you seeing any any challenges ahead? I mean, what what are you seeing in front of you uh, moving forward? Yeah, I mean, besides besides the elephant in the room right now being COVID nineteen, that's a real a real challenge for the industry right now, and and hopefully we'll be out of this whole deal soon. But to be honest, the biggest challenge I think our industry faces, and and not just in paper, in paper and pulp, uh, but in all manufacturing, is is attrition. I think, you know, the industry is seeing a lot of it's more experienced and knowledgeable folks start to retire and just not enough skilled labor and workforce to replace these people. So there's just a lot less, seems like there's a lot less young people interested in trade type work. And I think it's created a smaller pool of, of skilled candidates 
in a you know in a world where good electrical and mechanical resources are kind of needed more than ever. Yeah. So no I doubt. mean I I think we have a lot of young people still interested in engineering and I think you know the the numbers aren't really declining on the engineering side but you've got a lot of a, a huge pool of of folks that are retiring from engineering type roles as well in manufacturing and it's hard to fill those spots with with a lot of younger people that really want to work in a manufacturing setting you know this this job is not really for everybody i have to say so i think there's a shift developing in manufacturing to try to create a more i guess attractive work environment for younger people considering kind of some of the the priorities for this generation the millennials whatever you want to call it yeah that's right just knowing that those priorities have kind of shifted yeah. so you know, I've seen a lot of a push for work-life balance, you know, more diversity in the workplace and embracing, you know, newer ideas and technology. And I think that's going to help some of these manufacturing couple, companies stay viable and help, you know, keep and retain those young young talent that they find. And that'll help with the overall attrition, I think. It will. You know, one a couple of the episodes we're working on are, are around the skilled labor gap and you're you're all over it. And we're trying, we actually just did an uh, one that an episode where we're talking about manufacturing perception, and it's just about that, right? It's like wh- this is re- this is the reality of manufacturing. But a lot of time, when people think about industry, they think you know hot, long hours, you know, not great work environments. And we got to we, we got to change that, you know, or it's it's very narrow. You 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 work here at this this part of on assembly line, and that's all you do for the rest of your life. And that's not manufacturing now. And that's that's right. not industry, you know. So right. I'm, I'm curious for you. You know, what, what drew you to it? Just, I mean, just for us, by knowing, did you have exposure to industry? Or I'm curious on, on you, because you had a lot of different paths you could have took. Um, what, what was the big driver for you? Well, so it's kind of, it's kind of funny because I, when I first interviewed with IP and they, they actually took me to a mill or let me do a mill visit before I made my final decision, I went to the mill and I just remember walking around and my eyes were huge. I mean, I could not believe how close I could get to this equipment to, you know, see things up close and see the process and see people out on the floor working. And again, this is, this is not to say utility is not a good industry because I really enjoyed my time in a utility, but there's a lot more, uh, I guess a lot less interaction with folks out on the floor. So I knew immediately with international paper or any manufacturing facility, I guess that you are really going to get a hands on type approach to your job. It's going to be, you are, you have, there's days where I spend all day in the office sending emails and working on, um, bid packages. I mean, there's just those days you're going to have to spend in your office, but the majority of the time you are working side by side out in the field with electricians, mechanics, and operators. And to me, that's something that I really knew I I didn't want to compromise on that. I wanted that type of work environment where I wasn't just sitting in a room full of engineers. I wanted different perspectives and I wanted people from different walks of life. You know, I, I really wanted that, that work environment where I wasn't just confined to you are an electrical engineer that's all you do you know I've worked on hydraulics I mean we've worked on pumps I've worked on a lot of things that I never you know thought that I would as an electrical engineer I'd ever have to touch so I I really like that that varied work environment and I really like working with people from kind of all walks of life to me that that's where good ideas and and really good work comes out of so I, I personally, that drew me in. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you for walking through that. Cause I was, I was curious on for you and your path, what the draw was. And I think that that probably helped a lot of our listeners and, and, you know, Amanda with this series really trying to inspire women specifically to, to embrace the industry and manufacturing and, and, and look this way. Cause we, there definitely is a shortage and we, and we need more women to enter it. So for the women that are out there to maybe listening What's some advice you'd like to offer them about industry? I think, you know, in general, when it comes to deciding what you want to do with your career and if you're considering a manufacturing track, you know, my advice is to to give it a try, to do it with, with the understanding that there's going to be challenges. There's, there's going to be hot, dirty days. I mean, you mentioned that that, that is a negative thing that t- sometimes tends to push people away from this industry, but 
not every day is hot and dirty, but there are days that are, and people need to, you know, understand that that might be what you're getting yourself into a little bit. But I mean, my, my advice is really just to, to jump in and, and do it and, and go all in, you know, nothing's going to be a cakewalk and you're going to have to prove yourself. But if you want a job that's really fast paced and allows you to dig in, get your hands dirty, work in the field, work alongside people that are, you know, just regular everyday people and engineers, then I think manufacturing is the, the right fit, you know, and I, I think part of that, my, the best piece of advice I, I really ever got in my career is, is, is that you don't really just get respect, you earn it. So I see a lot of people coming out of school, um, they start off their career kind of with a chip on their shoulder, you know, I'm the engineer, I know more than you kind of attitude and when you work in a manufacturing facility, there's so many people that that have worked here years and years and years. And just you just can't replace four years of you can't replace all that experience with with four years of school. It just it just will That's never right. work. So to me, that that advice applies really to both to women and men, I, I think. But but I don't think anything could could really be more true. People can see when you show up to work every day and you're excited about your job. You're excited to be there and, and you're ready to help. And I think that kind of stuff sticks with people. So you can earn a lot of respect from from all levels of any company when you get out in the field and you get dirty and really try to understand something and have the the drive or the or the want to. Right. Um, and, and at that point, your skills and how smart you are or your degree or, or whether you're a woman or a man, it really doesn't matter. It's just the engagement and the passion that shine through. That's right. Just jump in and and become part of something, be part of something great. Right. So, I mean, yeah. what about the obstacles? We know that, that there are obstacles out there. What, is there anything you like to highlight from, for the women that may be considering that, that, that change in careers to expect? Yeah. I mean, the, there's, a, there's so few women that, that end up doing engineering or trade school. And then from there, there's even fewer that actually choose to work in manufacturing. And then Beyond that, there's fewer that work in, in a maintenance type of role. So when you get to that level and you get to that plant or that facility, you take a look around and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm literally surrounded by a bunch of men. It, it, it can be intimidating. And, and most of the time, a lot of the time, um, especially for younger females, you know, you're the youngest person. Not only are you the youngest person in the room, but you're also the only female. So I, I have to say that takes a while to get used to it. And for some people, I think that that can be an obstacle. And I think it can be, it's something to think about though, that it can be just as intimidating for the operators that you're standing next to or the maintenance crew that you're working with for the day to have a female in their, in their area because they're just not used to it. So you have to kind of think about, about the fact that it's probably just as weird for them as it is for you and just acknowledge that fact and move on from it. You know, so as long as, as long as they know that you're here to help and make a difference and you're not just going to stand there and point out what somebody's doing wrong, but jump in there with them and, and help them and, and try to make their lives better. I think at the end of the day, it's not going to matter if you're a female or not, you're, you're going to be able to, to overcome that obstacle. No doubt. No so, doubt. The only other obstacle I wanted to highlight is women at the point where they're having children. I think there's still a stigma with certain work environments where if a female needs flexibility to like take care of their child or, or sick kid or take their child to day daycare in the morning. So they end up getting to work at seven 30 instead of six 30. I, I do still think there's a, a stigma around that. And I, I've seen some of that play out in, in previous roles that I've had. So it's just something as a society we really got to get over. You know, people have different needs. And in the future, I think the more females you get in the workplace, I think it's going to become more commonplace and it's we're going to be able to get over it easier. Yep. But that is, that is something I feel like it's more just a tradition thing. Yeah. I mean, a company is going to have to learn to adapt. I mean, and understand right. that, hey, everybody has a different work, you know, work-life balance and family balance. And I mean – you know, adopt, it's going to take different policies. I mean, just, just go straight to maybe human resource type pl policies and programs to, because right. you, you want to be able to support those women that come to it and not have them feel like outsiders or, you know, right. like they're ad asking for something special that's not typically being asked for. So um, great observation on the obstacles. And uh, I, I know you said you were a softball player, so pick up your bat. I got, I got one. I want you to knock out the part for us. Okay. So. All right. 
common myths. There are some myths out there. You know, when people think about women in engineering or women in manufacturing or industry in general, uh, what's something you like to knock out and just say, nope, this is what you think is happening, but this is truth? Well, one thing that I hear a lot is that men make decisions based on reason and, and women make decisions based on emotions. And that's why women shouldn't or can't be in leadership roles. And that that's a, that to me is just total crap. Because <laughs> I, I think although some, you know, women tend to think more with the emotional side or, or with empathy or compassion for people, just based on, you know, their genetic makeup, I just don't see that as a downfall or a drawback. And I, I don't see why that would ever prevent a, a female from taking and doing a great job with a leadership position, because I think companies need to start thinking about the people. So I think if we adopt that mentality of let's take care of our people and let's create work-life balance. And that's the kind of attitude that's going to help us keep some of these millennials in manufacturing positions and, and keep more females in the workplace. Well, you know, you officially hit a home run on that one. So, I mean, that, yeah. okay. <laughs> that was awesome, Amanda. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. I mean, that's that you're right. I mean, great leadership and, and great observation by you. Uh, speaking specifically about you, when do you find you're having the most fun at work? where you're getting the most joy? Really, when I can take a problem, when I can, when I can see something through from start to finish and then ultimately see how it's improving somebody's life or helping move towards a common goal, that's when I'm really getting fulfillment out of my job. I love being able to take a problem and, and dissect it, figure out what's causing the issue or the breakdown or whatever it is, and then coming up with a solution that's just going to prevent us from having to go back to this dang motor or having to go back to this dang pump. I mean, that's the kind of thing that the the less calls I get at night or on weekends, the better, right? So I want the same thing for the people that work on the floor in my mill. You know, I want the same thing for my electricians. I don't, I want the same quality of life for them. You know, I don't, I don't get a whole lot of value about, of, out of doing something that I don't feel passionate about or believe in, or I don't feel like it's moving towards a common goal. And maybe that's not my best character trait, but when I'm really passionate and I'm, I'm digging into the details of an issue and, and working with my team to come up with a, a solution, that's, that's where, that's where we, we shine. So luckily, you know, working a paper mill, there's lots of those opportunities all around. I mean, we, we work in a, older facility. We have a lot of outdated equipment. So we have a lot of opportunities to make people's lives better. Um, but if you put in the time and effort, you know, the folks around you are going to put in the time and effort. And, you know, once they know that we're all playing for the same team. So what do you enjoy most? Is it the hunt for solving the problem or yeah, the engagement I, I, with the people around you to solve? I'm just curious on what, what that bigger driver is. I mean, it's kind of twofold, right? I, you know, the, the digging and the investigation is sort of where my engineer side comes in and that's just me. I can't, I can't help it when there's a problem. I just got to dissect every little piece of it, just dig into it as much as I can. But the real, I think, fulfillment, you know, when I go home at the end of the day and, and I'm proud of something I've done is when I can say that we worked as a team to, to solve a problem. You know, obviously the engineer in me wants to, wants to be that person that's, you know, figuring out exactly what's wrong and finding a root cause. But at the end of the day, when I have a, a really good day and I got a smile on my face and I go home, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm just having a great day. That's, those are the days when me and my team have, have done something together. Yeah. So we have a, a very common thread there, man. And that's, that's where I get the most joy to and just working with the team and accomplishing things together. You know, not everybody has that. Not everybody. Get, a lot of people are very, you know, this is fake. This, we can be truthful here. A lot of people are all about themselves. Right. Uh, but right. the fact that you're not and that you want to help others around and lift other people up, that's awesome. And that's just, it's going to take you so far in life. Uh, so hats off to you for, for what you've done yeah. and, and, and where you're at. And, you know, any highlights you have right now you'd like to share with our listeners so far, some cool things you've been able to work on or accomplish? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought about this question a little bit, and I, I have some projects that I could really, you know, say I'm proud of because I look at, you know, every time I pass that MCC, I'm like, oh, I installed that or I did this. But in all reality, um, I'm working sort of in a, in a I don't want to say individual contributor role, but I'm, I'm more on the engineering side now. Previously, I was a frontline leader for my for the E&I crew at a, at a previous mill that I worked at. So I had a crew of about 
uh, 12 electricians that were working for me. And I've got to tell you, it was one of the most challenging but rewarding periods of my life. Every day was kind of a, a new challenge, a new unknown, whether it was a, a breakdown of a major piece of equipment and all hands on deck are, are there to help. Or we, we had, you know, a situation where we went through a hurricane and, you know, we shut the mill down and started it back up, slept at the mill. You know, it was a it was a long couple of days and we started back up together. But um, we went through a lot of outages together. You know, I was dealing with personality differences and, and people issues and people butting heads. And it was just it was kind of a whirlwind. But no, no two days were the same when I was in that role. And I learned so much so fast. And I learned a lot about myself and and how people perceive me or how I could come off, whether it was was good or bad, Um, how to take care of my people and and be their champion, you know, and and lift them up like we talked about and how just how to become a a leader. You know, I was totally out of my element. You know, I was uncomfortable a lot of the time and I would get frustrated or angry when, when things didn't go my way. But we had to, you know, learn how to work through it together. So after I started to learn how to deal with the unknown, and I, I think I got pretty good at that, um, it just it just showed that, you know, that you could really be successful with a team that way. So that that group of guys, you know, they became my second family, really. I would still do anything for them today. So no it doubt. was a had a really good group support me. And I felt like that experience has kind of shaped me into who I am now. No doubt. I mean, and outages in, in themselves, they grow, they make everyone grow. Anybody who's gone through an outage, uh, you know, that just, it, it definitely shapes you. And then the people around you uh, can make it either a good outage or, or a tough outage, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but either way. Yeah. So we, like I said, that, that period we went through with the hurricane was, was several on days on end of just misery at the time. But looking back, I'm just, you know, I'm just so thankful to have had that experience. I, there wasn't one part of that powerhouse that I hadn't crawled all over at that point. So I really thinking back, it was miserable, but I, I learned a lot out of that. Absolutely. So um, Amanda, we love on these episodes to talk a little bit outside of the plan, outside of the working environment, just to let our listeners know a little bit about uh, you as a person. (laughs) Because there's there's definitely more to, to you than than an engineer, although that's a you're definitely proud of that part. So, any hobbies or anything you like to share? I really enjoy anything outdoors. I like hiking a lot. I I love going to the river, going to the beach, um, and I think a lot of that comes from when I was younger. My dad actually he would take my brother on or one of my brothers on Boy Scout trips, he was really big into Boy Scouts and he would sometimes drag me along on these hiking trips. And at the time I was like, Oh gosh, dad, why are you taking me on the Boy Scout trip to go hiking? But looking, looking back, those are some of my, some of my most fond memories because we, we did a ton of awesome stuff. I mean, we hiked the Grand Canyon, we hiked Glacier National Park. I mean, we went all over the United States. So I really, really, really enjoy doing that kind of thing now at the, you know, like I said, at the time, I don't think I really appreciated it, but we, we love taking our dog to the river. She's a big fan of, of, of the river and she loves, she's a, a chocolate lab. So she's, Okay. Just loves to swim. She just loves to swim. That's her favorite pastimes. Now you're saying we, so can you tell us a little bit about your family? Yeah, of course. I, I'm when I say we, I mean me and my boyfriend, and and we've been together a little over six years now. He's a really great guy. You know, he he's seen me through some of my some of my different phases of life at this point, good and bad, and and I'm just really thankful to have someone like him who understands me and um, who's always been my number one fan, really. So, and, and of course, my dog that I mentioned, her name's Josie, and she's she's the sweetest little dog in the world. So, got to throw a shout out to her too. Nice. But um, my family in Virginia, you know, they're they're kind of their trip. I've got a pretty big, quirky, loud family, and, and I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> my my parents are are pretty much my biggest inspiration. You know, my they're two of the hardest working people I've ever known. Um, my dad, he grew up on a on a farm in Southern North Carolina and, and worked on the farm all through school, got a degree in electrical engineering from NC State. Um, but I always like to think that that was his part time job because he is really, truly a, a jack of all trades. I mean, he likes cars and he fixes engines and he loves to farm. He, he loves to garden. So I think those are kind of his full time jobs and the engineering 
gig as his part-time job. I mean, that, that man can fix anything. Nice. My mom, she got her degree from Christopher Newport up in Virginia where she grew up. And, you know, while she was raising us four crazy kids, she ended up going back to school and she got her master's degree. Um, now she's an HR director for our county school system back where I grew up. So she's I mean, she's a superwoman. She's a works her tail off. And she but she is also, you know, one of the kindest hearted people you'll ever meet. So really, really wonderful parents. And my siblings are extremely unique, super talented. My brother, older brother and sister are the musical ones in the family, I could say. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't get that talent, but they, they have such confidence in performing in front of other people. And I just never, I was never blessed with that. Um, and my, my little brother, he's, he's the quiet one, but he's very smart and thoughtful and he works up on a research farm and in, in the mountains of North Carolina. And he's probably the only skateboarding farmer farmer you will ever meet. So very unique very family, yeah. <laughs> well, you make sure you turn all that. Everybody's got to listen to your episode, Amanda. They all need to check yeah. this one out and and hear all this wonderful story. And I mean, just something like you have an awesome family. That's great. And for our listeners too, we always like to give them some tips. Anything, any books, podcasts, or anything like that that you like to share uh, for ideas or just things you just enjoy enjoy in general. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't mention it earlier, but a. Uh, a couple things books wise that I've read that have helped me through my leadership role, seven habits of highly effective people, which is a very commonly read book, but man, it's a good one. Um, there's a book called leaders eat last. That's really good. And and you don't have to be, you don't need a title to be a leader is another one I like from, for some leadership books. Um, I'm also a, a huge classic literature fan. I love um, anything Jane Austen or the Bronte sisters, which is, you know, I think part of my um, feminism side, because those women really wrote a lot of really good books in a time when women authors were not very popular. And as far as podcasts, I'm a huge podcast fan. I listen to podcasts almost every single morning. And I'm, again, I'm really excited to listen to this podcast next, but um, I'm a big fan of This American Life. I just love listening to stories about people from different walks of life and just kind of learning about some of the amazing things that people have gone through and, you know, trials and tribulations. And I, I love a, I love a really uplifting story. There's also, you know, Invisibilia is another good podcast by, by two women that are really good writers and they help kind of, you know, inspire me to, to think outside the box and Radio Lab is another is another podcast to listen to that's kind of nerdy, a little sciencey, but it's very interesting stories. And I mean, it's just, again, I love a good story. So, cool. well, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing those. It sounds like some great, great things to check out for our listeners. And Amanda, we always love to kind of summarize the, the episodes of Eco Ask Why with the why. And it's talking more about the purpose and the drive behind what we do. So, if you had to summarize that, what would be your personal why? Well, the, I, you know, I, I really hope that this recording reaches out to, to some young girl somewhere or someone who's considering a career change to a manufacturing field or has always wanted to do this type of work and, and show them that if you, you know, if you work hard, you try your hardest and, and just have passion for what you do and put your heart and soul into it, there's nothing that's going to stop you. You know, I, I've encountered a lot of obstacles, a lot of barriers and, and sometimes it's been, you know, is this worth it? But for me, I just keep keep rolling because I have this goal. You know, I have this this goal in my life and in my career, and I just haven't lost sight of it. You know, I just want to help as many people as I can and be a part of a team. That's just something I've just always strived to 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 achieve in my career. So. I think people eventually start to believe in you and, and you'll find that, you know, you start to believe in yourself a little bit. So eventually you'll, you'll achieve those things and, and, you know, you, the, the reward will be very, very worth it. So that's, you know, part of what drives me. And, and I hope this is a great platform for me to, to talk to or get the word out to some of these younger females who are considering this type of work. It's not, it's not impossible. It's not pretty, but it's, it's not impossible and, and it can be done. And, and I, I love every second of it. So I hope people uh, open their eyes a little bit more to it and open their minds to it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you're an inspiration, Amanda. I mean, thank you so much. I mean, from 
the, the things you've done in your career with your training through through college and I mean you you're going to do a wonderful things in the future and I'm excited just just to watch what you do and just knowing that there's people like you in the in the roles that you're in uh, that's what's going to make this country you know keep it number one in manufacturing in the world so I mean this is this is wonderful that uh, you know that you took the time with us for this I know our listeners are going to enjoy you know, hearing your story. So I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time with us today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys so much for having me. And again, thank you for getting, you know, all these wonderful women's stories out and, and letting young girls know that, that this is possible. You know, this is a, a really good thing that you guys are doing. So I'm, I'm super, I'm proud and I'm humbled to be a part of this, this experience. So thank you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.